I'm Michael Hochberg. I was, until about a week ago, a professor at the University of Washington. As of this week, I'm a professor at the University of Delaware. Um, and basically, I run an institute that is moving over to Delaware over the next couple of months called OPSIS. And OPSIS is basically an attempt to make the very advanced processes that have been developed for making silicon photonics to make them accessible to the wider community. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we have these fantastically complex processes. For instance, there's one at Luxterra that they've spent the last 10 years developing and honing. And, you know, I was one of the founders there many years ago, and you know, a lot of effort has gone into that. And that's a process where you can build modulators and detectors and waveguides, and they all talk to each other, and you can build full 130 nanometer CMOS. Right? And that's, that's a very complex thing. It's, you know, many, many mask layers, and it costs millions of dollars every time you want to run it and you want to put a new design into it. It's a problem that's been solved by virtue of having what are called shuttle runs, where you have an organization, there's one called Moses, for instance, that's been around for a very long time, that aggregates together lots of users into a, into a run, and each one pays a few thousand dollars for, per square millimeter to get access to this shuttle. And what it means is that you aggregate them all together, you run it through the process, you get the wafers back, you dice up the wafers and send each person their own devices. And there's no IP encumbrance associated with it because you, own, you as the user own your design IP, the foundry owns their, their fabrication associated IP, and, they're, and basically you're paying them to make use of their IP um, and to build the devices. And that's a very standard model. That's the basis of the fabulous model in the electronics industry. So what we're trying to do is to get a fabulous model going for the photonics industry, specifically for silicon photonics. And we've got three foundries we're working with. This week we announced that Luxterra is going to be allowing us to run things through their process. We also have a very strong relationship with both BAE Systems and Manassas and with um, IME in Singapore. And in each of those cases, what we're doing is actually co-developing a process. We have some, some areas where in these processes we have really advanced devices, uh, some areas where silicon doesn't give you the best devices in the world, and that's in the nature of any material system. But the unusual thing about silicon is that you can do pretty much everything except a light source in silicon, and there are some approaches that we're exploring to do light sources. What, that'll, what that's going to allow people to do as users is to put modest amounts of money into this, tens of thousands of dollars, even thousands of dollars, to participate and be able to get chips back where the individual devices are essentially guaranteed to work by the foundries. And so optics designers will be able to stop worrying about the device physics and start thinking about architecture. And I think that's a, I think that's a hugely exciting transition where, you know, just like in the transistor world 40 years ago, it became possible to be a an electronic chip designer without having to worry too much about how the transistors themselves work. I've been really impressed with how the community has sort of shown up in, in the person of many of these vendors and been willing to spend time and spend effort on you know, figuring out how they can play with this stuff and how they, how they can interact with it. Um, and so there's, there's just an enormous number of collaborations going forward all in parallel around this stuff right now. There's actually been a, a, a sort of groundswell of support for this. Uh, we've been sort of shocked at the demand for, for this stuff, um, pleasantly shocked. While we're stabilizing the processes and while we're developing them, the users are getting access to the things that are you know, really in the realm of development runs. And so it's, it, it gives the users access to things where there's a higher risk profile but where the, where the performance is really leading edge. The more you can leverage things that have been developed for the CMOS world, the more of an advantage that you can capture. And that's the reason that silicon photonics, in my view, at its core, is exciting, is because it's not just that you can use some of the same machines, and it's not just that you can use some of the same wafers, it's that you can actually run silicon photonic devices through the same facilities that are used to make ultra-high ultra performance CMOS devices. And what I would say is that silicon has turned out to be a fairly unique platform, not because it's the best at any one thing, although we're starting to get to the point where it, where it actually is the best for some things, for some devices. 
it's that the one thing silicon is unambiguously known to be the very best for is for CMOS electronics, right? It, you, you, if you want to do large scale electronics, silicon's where you go. And if you want to do high speed, bipolar CMOS, is, you know, by CMOS is a great place to go for high speed. Um, yeah, the, they're not the best transistors in the world, right? The best transistors in the world are often made in three fives, but they're really good and they scale up really quickly. Um, if we can do the same thing for photonics, what we can do is we can drive the marginal cost of complexity down. And if we can do it in processes that are in some way or the other compatible with the processes that you use to make transistors, well, then you get the transistors alongside the optics. And so then you have a platform where the marginal cost of complexity for manipulating both photons and electrons can be fantastically low. I think that's a huge opportunity.